Good evening. Well, let's all uh, join our voices together in Micah 6 8. Thank you again for your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for your word. And may we heed it, encourage us, Lord, even, uh, even convict us, if need be, to walk with you and not against you. Lord, we pray that we will grow uh, stronger in our Savior with the passage of time. And uh, we ask even tonight that we might find blessing that draws closer to you now than we were at the beginning of the day. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, let's see, don't forget, if you serve with the uh, patch, the pirate ministry, there is a patch leaders meeting after the service tonight. Okay, where's that at? Patch room. In the patch room, okay, very good. And uh, also, um, we do have, a, just a reminder, we have a list of nursery workers. All the, the nursery workers are on this list down in the patch, or in the, the nursery room, but only the ones that are highlighted in yellow are currently active. So when you are ready to serve in the nursery, would you go downstairs and highlight your name with the yellow highlighter that's down there? And as we get more workers, we can add uh, more services with a nursery ministry. Right now, we're providing nursery for the 11 a.m. service only until we get a few more workers for that, okay? And then this is going to be our, our last regular evening service for a while because next week at this time we'll be trying Sunday school. This is to allow for that 9 o'clock service in the morning, which is just repeated at 11. We want to, we want to offer that for a while, at least for the time being. So we're going to try Sunday school at night just for a while uh, for all ages starting next week at 6. Jeremiah is our Sunday school superintendent. He said uh, that we start at 6. And that means, parents, you have to drop your children off at Sunday school, um, the little ones, and then you need to pick them up at Sunday school. They won't just be released from their class, okay? You've got to go get them. And that means we adult teachers need to have 45-minute classes, okay? 45 minutes from 6 to, to 6.45. Now, to kick this off, if the weather permits next week, we will have a fire and fellowship out there um, uh, in the lawn, uh, after Sunday school. So next week, you want to dress appropriately for that. Uh, again, if the, the weather is good. Um, we won't have a food table set out. If you, you bring marshmallows or something, just bring your own for your own family. Um, and we'll just forego our typical food fellowship for the time being. Okay? And then this Wednesday, Patch the Pirate and Little Lambs will be up and running, as well as the Junior Youth Group. That's going to be uh, operating as well. And we do have a business meeting scheduled a week from Wednesday. That's July 8th, okay? And uh, we completely missed our spring business meeting. So we just have some reports and information to catch up on. And uh, I'll bring you more. I'll have an agenda set up next Sunday that you can take home and pray over. Okay? All right. Very good. Alan, come lead us.
clean hands. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees, O Spirit, come make us humble. We turn That was our uh, theme song for Men's Adventure many years ago. And ever since, I, d I didn't like it. But it stuck in my head. And every time I'm tempted to do something wrong, I start singing this song. And this song has is, is helped me tremendously. I was surprised because I really didn't like it at first, but I love this song now. <laughs> All right. So let's move on to If My People... If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. Anybody remember Greg and Heather? I got their uh, their DVD in my car and I listened to that. 
that all the time. Love that song, too. All right, we have a ministry of music tonight? We don't. Well, there's not much I know. I just work here. <laughs> all right, we're, we're going to go on with part two of the book of Jude. Really short book. It's only 25 verses. We've been singing about... Um, We've been singing a theme of you know, being faithful and being cleaned by God because we, by nature, are so dirty and are so quick to walk in dirt. There's a little girl who, um, she's a farm girl, but uh, Sal had piglets. One was a little teeny tiny pig, uh, a little runt, and she took to it. And she took this little piglet and took it in the house and she cleaned it up really good, and she washed it and bathed it, put powder on it, you know, and a little ribbon on it. Then she took her little piglet outside to play, and do you know what that pig did? That pig ran straight into that mud and wallowed all in the mud after she'd put all that work into it. Now, why'd that pig do that? That's what pigs do, okay? That's why. And uh, we are by nature sinful people. Praise God through the power, the grace, and mercy of Jesus Christ our Lord. We are saved from the eternal power of sin, the eternal penalty of sin. And someday, when we're in glory, we'll even be saved from the very presence of sin. Because sin is not eternal. And we are. But until that day, boy, it's a, it's a battle, isn't it? It's rough. And... Uh, and disbelief threatens even the walk of the believer, uh, which is why so much of Scripture is a warning, and that's really why Jude wrote this book. He really wanted to talk about the, the joys of salvation and, being, and encourage uh, these dear Christians that he wrote to, but he was prompted by the Lord to write on a more negative subject of contending for their faith because it's not easy to walk the walk of faithfulness in Jesus Christ. And so he wrote this letter, and he needed to to these particular Christians because of what was creeping in to their church. And uh, these, are, these are Jewish Christians. We know that because Jude makes so many references to the Old Testament, and only Jews would have been familiar with those accounts from the Old Testament. The, the, the Gentile Christians of that day would not have been too familiar yet. They weren't as adverse in, uh, in the Jewish culture. Um, so that's who he's writing to. And uh, he's dealing with some things that have gotten into the church, and they've been getting into the church ever since. They've been getting into the church for 2,000 years. Two terms that uh, we use from time to time because they're things we have to deal with, and that is hypocrisy and heresy. Uh, they're not the same thing. But they're related. Hypocrisy. What is hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is one is when one says he believes something, but in practice demonstrates he believes something else. Okay, that's hypocrisy. The Pharisees were full of hypocrisy. They said they believed in the God of the Old Testament, and yet their lifestyle completely contradicted God. Period. And then there's heresy. And heresy is defined as forming an opinion that contradicts the ways of God. Right? And, and heresy has to deal with disbelief. We start, even Christians will start to form opinions that are based on disbelief and not on belief. And before you know it, we contradict the word of God. Right? Heresy and hypocrisy have long creeped into the church. They were creeping into this these Christians' lives, and so Jude wrote them uh, this letter. See, he wrote this for fear that his audience was letting their guard down. All right? and the danger of letting your guard down is that you will allow for heresy to be taught in your church. You really will. And once you start swallowing that, you're a hypocrite because you'll start practicing hypocrisy soon afterwards. And that, he wasn't accusing these Jew, uh, Jewish Christians of doing that. His fear was they were on the verge of doing that because of some 
false teachers who had crept into their midst and was teaching these things. And uh, I don't think we have false teachers at Open Door Baptist Church. I think we follow certain protocols to try our best to minimize that. Um, but it's something we always have to be aware of because you may not get heretical false teaching from within the assembly of our church family, but you can sure get it in a lot of other places, all right? The, um, there's, there's radio, there's television, there's Facebook, there is all kinds of places you can get false teaching that will affect your opinions and, and start to sway you the wrong way. Now, this is a warning. Remember, he's, uh, he's, Jude's going to describe some results of heresy and, and, and uh, uh, how that prompts people to make poor decisions. But it's a warning. As I said, he's not accusing them. Okay, He's not beating them up. He's just warning them so that they, they are spared the pain of uh, falling later. This is not a beat up on them, on us. It's just a warning. I remember when I was, um, oh, I guess I must have been about eight, nine, maybe nine, ten years old. And um, there was a made for TV movie that starred Robbie Benson. Remember Robbie Benson? He would have been a kid then, he would have been a teenager. And um, the drug culture was just so rampant by the, by the late 70s. You know, it had been going strong at that point for a solid 15 years, 14 years, and it was just such a problem with the American youth, you know, unlike today. And the, Robbie Benson made a, made a movie, and it was, it was actually a true story that had happened just a few years earlier about a kid who got strung out on drugs, he got hooked, and um, he got so violent, he attacked his dad, and, and right or wrong, his dad, and a moment of uncertainty pulled out a firearm in self-defense and killed his own son which is of course how the movie ended and it just showed the, de the deterioration of how those drugs just took him down that path worse and worse and worse and as a nine-year-old boy watching that movie with my mom that was devastating and uh, when it was over you know, my mom turned off the TV and had a talk with me she said this is why I don't ever ever want you to take drugs and and people in your life are going to offer them to you and you're going to have opportunity to do that I don't ever want you to do that because that's where it could take you nine years old she wasn't chastising me she was warning me I was never even tempted to do drugs and I had friends all over the place that did I sat and my uh, junior math class with a girl behind me who said, Dave, don't move. I don't want the teacher to see me because she was snorting a line of coke at her desk. Okay? And uh, that never even tempted me. Okay? You know, um, not in the slightest. I wasn't tempted to do that. I was tempted to turn around and go, <laughs> send $400 worth of coke flying in the air. Uh, but this, this is what a warning can do. So while we read this and we think, boy, this is sure negative and heavy stuff, yeah, because the consequences of walking away from your God are negative and heavy stuff. But the, the results of heeding Jude's warning result in really spiritual bliss as you just walk hand in hand with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we're wanting to do here. So let's take a look at what disbelief, even in your walk, um, will prompt you to do. And, and some of you have already done this. Some of you will be tempted to. First of all, I want you to see in num verse number five, uh, verse, verse five, that disbelief will prompt you to turn your back on God's evidence. He uses the Israelites and their start in their freedom from Egypt as an example of this. He says, but I want to remind you, though you once knew this, and it's okay to remind people of what they already know, very little of what I preach to the majority of mature Christians at Open Door Baptist Church is new material. Very little. You've you, you walked through the scriptures for years, okay? Um, and yet, why is it you unlatch a, uh, 
uh, passage of scripture that you've been reading for years and God see, teaches you something else that you didn't see before. So it's good to, to review things that you already know. I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And this is, again, talking about their freedom from Egypt, their following of God through the wilderness into the promised land, and then their consistent acts of disobedience because they just did not believe him time after time again in spite of all the evidence. That account is repeated several times in the Word of God. It's repeated in the Old Testament. It's repeated in the New Testament. Uh, it comes up again and again and again, and here we are. Uh, what, what did those Israelites do? Well, they saw the evidence of God, but disbelief prompted them to turn their back on it. Right? They saw him send plagues that finally changed the Pharaoh's mind. And then they saw the parting of the Red Sea, which destroyed the Pharaoh's army. And they saw the uh, manna from heaven every single morning, except for the Sabbath. Six days a week. They go out there, there's that edible bread. They saw that every day. They saw him bring a miraculous swarm of quail, just all these coveys of quail, so that they had plenty of meat. He saw, they saw water come from rocks, just like that, so that they wouldn't die of thirst. They saw provision after provision. They saw all this evidence that God was in this. And they still just turned their backs on him and didn't believe. These same Israelites disbelieved the power of God. It's easy to find yourself in that situation. If you've been walking with the Lord any length of time, uh, and it's genuine, then you have seen evidence. You've seen it in your own life. If you are truly born again, okay, you are not the same person you were before. Right? Um, even if you got saved as a child, you, you see God's evidence at work. And if you're not careful, disbelief will prompt you to turn your back on the evidence. Uh, he's given you evidence not only in your own life, he's given you lots of external evidence. Just the very fact that you have the Bible in your hands. This is a book that, that humanly speaking, should not exist. So many people have tried to destroy it. It really should not be here. And yet here it is. And it will stand forever. It's written in heaven. It will endure uh, you've got all kinds of evidence. The evidence that Jesus Christ really did rise from the, the grave. Do you know how many eyewitnesses there were to that account? You know, we believe in things that happened even before Christ came to this earth because we find writings in archives from archaeological digs. And we say, well, then that must be true. And that's even older. But we have even more evidence of the resurrected Savior. We have so many re uh, written records found in the Word of God. There are so many witnesses that saw that. The evidence is just overwhelming that you have a, a faithful God. Um, and disbelief will, will tempt you. Now, when it says in verse 5 that he destroyed those who did not believe, destroyed does not mean annihilated so that they are no more. The word destroyed is a translation of a of a, a Greek word that means ruined or, or, or lost. Okay? Not gone, as in no longer exists, but just ruined. It's a term that does not mean a loss of being, but rather a loss of well-being. And in that sense, those Israelites were destroyed because of their disbelief. They lost their well-being. Um, the majority of them lost that wonderful privilege of entering the promised land. Now, the, the, the nation as a whole, God kept his promise, and they went in. But it was their kids that got to go in. Most of them died out there in the wilderness. Many of them were probably unbelievers individually, and their loss was an eternal loss uh, of separation from God. Many of them may have been believers, but they still lost that privilege and didn't get the joy of entering the promised land. A few did. A few of them did, like Joshua, Caleb, uh, but most of them did not, okay? Being a child of God, you have really no reason to fear uh, a state of eternal loss, right? You have no reason to fear that, that you're saved from eternal destruction. But 
while your eternal being can never be destroyed, disbelief in God's power means even now in this life you can lose your well-being. And I've just seen that happen too many times. In fact, I've experienced that myself. Uh, in my walk with the Lord, when I was in my early 20s, I, I got away from the Lord and started walking in disbelief, and turned my back on his evidence, lost my well-being. And uh, self-pity, extreme worry, fatigue, things like that are the results. And it need not be. And this is what was threatening them. This threatens us all the time as well. Here's what else disbelief will prompt you to do, and this is in verse 6. It will prompt you to turn your back on God's provision when he provides. And here he used the angels as an example for that. God provided for the angels. In verse 6 it says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Now, because this is prophecy about things that are still coming, they're still coming, and because it involves things that happen in the angelic world, which the people were not there, there's a lot of mystery and a lot of questions with that. Um, but it's easy to understand the message, okay? Judas is likely referring to the angels who fell with Satan. These would be the fallen angels because not all angels sin. Uh, Isaiah 14 describes Satan's fall and Revelation 12, 4 describes that a third of those angels went with him. We don't know how many that is. We don't know how many, God, we don't know how many angels God made. Uh, it could be in the billions for all we know. Uh, what we do know is that whatever that number is, a third of them followed Satan. And it's these angels that he is speaking of here. Okay, um, it, it seems that in other passages of Scripture, some angels are, are even more guilty than others and are already in some type of a confined prison right now. Um, but yet, verse 6, it might refer to all angels because there is a, a real sense in which all fallen angels, all demons, um, are... Uh, already in darkness awaiting that day uh, that, that's why in throughout the new testament you always see they, they they seem to need to possess something you know and if it wasn't a man then a uh, herd of swine will do but that they're just they're already in a, a type of prison they already are, are, are they've already lost their freedom that they had in that wonderful abode in the glory and the heavenly places of god uh, they don't have that anymore uh, and they had it. God provided everything they, they needed. The main point here is that the angels turned their back on what God provided for them. Um, they had everything. Can you imagine that? You haven't sinned. You're singing praises to the God Almighty every single day. You're watching him create the world it just, it's just wonderful. And uh, that was all because of God. And Satan turned his back on that. It wasn't good enough for Satan. He convinced a whole lot of the other angels to, to follow suit. Well, Christians do the same thing. It's just heartbreaking to see teenagers who grow up in a home in which a Christian environment is very lovingly provided. Not perfectly, because parents are sinners too, but lovingly provided and that's not a guarantee okay uh, no parent can be blamed because every individual is responsible for his own choice and will stand before the lord at the end of his life not before his mom and dad so it's not can't be all put on mom and dad individuals will grow up with that wonderful provision and really it's a provision of god to grow up in a christian home and still turn their back on that provision and walk away. Listen, Christian, you'll do the same thing. Um, here, here's, what I've, here's what I've discovered. People who are really happy here at Open Door Baptist Church, move away, go to school, something like that, um, change of jobs, and, and we'll say, boy, having a hard time finding a church just like Open Door. I hear this. I hear this frequently. Anytime people, people move away, when, when they're happy here. Uh, and, and you get the idea. Open Door is the perfect church, and there's only one. 
We were in the perfect church. That's what you would think, talking to these folks. But you know what? We've had visitors come here who have moved from out of state, come to our church, and came once or twice and said, I'm going to keep looking because this just isn't my home church. I guess they went to the perfect church. You see, when you are happy serving the Lord where you're at with your church family, okay, you're, 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 you're in a place where God is providing and you're seeing that provision. And so then you go away and it's easy to think he's not providing there. He is. He is. He's providing in that church too. But that church, like any church, has a different personality. People have different personalities and so do churches. But God is the provider for all of them. So if you move away, young people, if you go away to college or if anybody moves and relocates, don't go look for Open Door Baptist Church. Go look for a church where God is providing through his word and through the people, and you'll be in a good church, right? even if they're not exactly like us. All right? In fact, I guarantee you their pastor is probably better. All right? But look for the provision of God. The angels didn't do that. A third of them didn't anyway. He's already provided so much for you here in your life right now. And he's, he's going to continue to do so. He offers a, a cup that just runs over. So don't allow disbelief to creep into your life and cause you to turn your back on, God, on what God has provided. I know sometimes you feel the responsibility of Christian living to be overwhelming. But listen, you are responsible for much only because you've been given so much. In the Lord Jesus Christ. Make the most of it. And he's, he's, remember, he's also provided you the ability to do what he's called you to do. And then thirdly, I want you to see in verse 7 that disbelief will prompt you to turn your back on God's ways. On God's ways. And here he used the, uh, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah to describe this situation. He says, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them. There were other settlements around there. They were all wrapped up in this. And the cities around them, in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal life. This is a strong example of people who, who are in Hades right now, awaiting the day of judgment where they will be sent into the lake of fire. Why? Because of disbelief. They turn their back on God's ways. Now, in light of this verse, I believe the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities could have repented. They certainly could have. God's righteous ways were not a foreign matter to them. They had access to the ways of God. They, they, they had Lot. And, and Lot knew God. He, he's, he's, he's in the presence of God today. He's counted in uh, the New Testament as one who did practice his faith. And he certainly practiced his weaknesses too. But he evidently was a shining light of God Almighty right there in the, the cities and in the gates of Sodom and Gomorrah. And they didn't listen. So they could have repented, but they chose disbelief as an avenue to follow, they turn their back on God's ways. Well, today, we are in a nation that is drifting further and further and further from God's righteous ways, okay? All kinds of, of sin is rampant. Um, people are, are, well, they've dismissed God from society starting in the 60s when they kicked him out of school. Um, television, and movies, and so-called entertainment has approached a no boundaries playing field. Uh, anything goes anymore. And uh, we live in a country now that is, is filled with people that are living um, in denial of reality, wanting to erase American history as if it doesn't exist. Um, this is what's going on in our nation. And it would seem desperate except it shouldn't for us. We have dual citizenship. The Apostle Paul claimed his citizenship as a Roman. He claimed more tightly to his citizenship in heaven. We are citizens of America. 
We can claim that too. But more importantly, we are citizens of God's kingdom. And that one lasts forever. Listen, God told Abraham he would have spared those cities for the sake of just ten righteous people. Remember that conversation Abraham had with God? And he started out, what did he start out with? Was it 50? Can't remember. He started out with a big number, and God said, Yeah, I'll spare that city. Didn't find that many. And he said, Well, if I can be so bold, Lord, if I find 20, yeah, I'll spare him for 20. And he got all, he, he talked, he talked to God until he got him down to 10. If I can just find 10, because I think Abraham knew what he was dealing with, with those people. He knew the culture. He said, I, there's no way I'm going to find 50 people, but if I can find 10, and God said, I will spare that entire city if you can find 10 righteous. And righteous means just people who believed in God, accepted his ways. Couldn't find them. Lot was it. Unbelief can permeate an entire nation, obviously. It can even, it can even permeate a church. And then unrighteous actions result. And it most certainly, unbelief, can permeate an individual life. It can permeate your life, and unrighteous actions will certainly result, causing you to turn your back on God's ways, ways that you never thought that you would. You think this won't happen to you? Think about this. Is there anybody you know, any Christian, born-again Christian, who has turned his or her back on the ways of God? Every single one of us knows people like that. Maybe you've been that person at one time, and now you're walking with the Lord. Praise God Almighty. But take heed to the warning. So results of disbelief, they differ, okay? But uh, disbelief was the common denominator, for sure. And Jude has given you some pretty extreme examples here of what disbelief will prompt you to do. And you'll find this to be true, though, if you're not careful, that disbelief will prompt you to turn your back on God's evidence, on his provision, and on his ways. It is possible for any believer, no matter what his or her stature is, or what his or her status is, it's possible for any believer to become an extreme example of disbelief. But it's also possible for any believer to become an extreme example of belief. Most definitely. You know who I think was an example of that? I think Michael the Archangel. All the evidence points to Lucifer having been the original arch or highest angel. All the evidence seems to point to him. He was it. And it just wasn't enough. And when God cast him out of heaven and threw him to earth, Michael was the next one in line. And here was an angel with a humble attitude, one who enjoyed the evidence of God, made the most of God's provision, and walked in God's ways. And we see evidence of that. We'll look at that even later in this book, when even he would not rebuke Satan. Say, oh, the Lord's going to take care of you. I'm not going to step in the place of God like you did. Michael's a good example to follow. Yeah, he's one of several of those who just practice faith and, and are wonderful examples. So heed the warning. Instead of running from God, you find yourself more and more prompted to run to God. And that's belief. And there's nothing hypocritical nor heretical about that. Father, we thank you again for these examples, Lord. And we just praise you for Your faithfulness to us in spite of our often unfaithfulness to you. Lord, may your laws just be ingrained in our hearts, on our minds. Do what's necessary, Lord, to cause each one of us to grow more and more in our desire to know your ways, to walk in your ways, to live your ways. Lord, we need that more and more as the world continues to drift away. Father, may may we just cling to Christ, our anchor, so we drift not at all. In Jesus' name, amen.
Now you want to lead us in the law of the Lord. We started out tonight singing scripture, straight out of scripture in Micah 6, 8. Which happens to be a song we sang all the time when I was in youth group back in the 70s. We're going to end up the night singing directly out of scripture from Psalm 19. And starting in verse 7, going down to verse 10. And, and this is literally straight out of scripture, identical word for word. There's another verse. <laughs> oh, there is? Yeah, I missed one. Yeah, I missed it. Well, that's part two of Jude. I don't know when we'll get to Jude 3 because when I started this last week, I didn't know we were going to uh, do Sunday school at night. So probably when we finished 1 Corinthians and uh, then we'll pick up Jude again and finish that. So it's really tough these days to put together a preaching curriculum and a, and a plan. Hard to figure out where we're going. So uh, this is uh, this will be our Lord willing. This will be our last day of these restrictions. I'll dismiss you by by pews. You can go outside. Please go all the way through and enjoy the sunshine. Isn't it great to see the sun shining tonight? And um, if the uh, statistics continue to maintain as they are here in Madison County, with the numbers as low as they are, then we'll lift these restrictions next week and um, and remove the pew signs. But as always, and from now on and forever, if you're sick, stay home. You know, even if all you have is a cold. I personally don't want your cold. Neither does anybody else. And uh, it used to be a, I think it used to be a, a point of, of spiritual maturity to tough it out and go to church even with your, when you're sick. Well, actually, it's, um, it's, a, it's a point of maturity to think of other people. It's like, yeah, I'm going to stay home, rest, and get better. I'll be back at it next time, okay? All right. I'll come back and dismiss you, and the love offering box is set up for you.